and I will be also talking about <clears throat> in the Bhagavad Gita how Krishna is to increase Narada um, Muni's love for him, um, what he's going to do, a little bit of the background of how that came about. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Because they are so potent, anything we associate which has been associated with them, we bear a great blessing. Uh, that is why it is very nice if a person has some deity and it touches the feet, which already has accumulated some dust for the day. So you take that dust and put it on your head. So Narada Muni is quite an illustrious bhakta, a devotee. He's humble, unassuming, dedicated, and he has all mystic powers. He can appear in one place, in this world, and a second later, he can appear in another world. So amazing is his power. And yet he is very unaffected by any of this. He couldn't care less about this. He just uses these to get Krishna's work done which is the way any type of power that we receive should be regarded. Uh, with a certain amount of, of indifference, notwithstanding the fact that you have something that very few people in the entire uh, universe has, but that belongs to Krishna. And because it belongs to Krishna, the devotee does not identify it as his own. He identifies it as being Krishna's own, and that Krishna has leaked a gift into his own consciousness, a gift to be used in the loving service of Krishna. So, um, so we've done the translation. Now uh, we we'll read the purport. Devotional service rendered to the personality of Godhead never goes in vain, since the personality of Godhead is eternal. Intelligence applied in his service or anything done in his relation is also permanent. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said that such transcendental service rendered unto the personality of Godhead accumulates birth after birth. And when the devotee is fully matured, the total service counted together makes him eligible to enter into the association of the personality of God. Such accumulation of God's service is never vanquished, but increases till fully mature. And what happens when it is fully mature, as is indicated here, one returns back home, back to Godhead. So let me just re read the translation one more time. Intelligence engaged in my devotion cannot be thwarted at any time, even at the time of creation, as well as at the time of annihilation. Your remembrance will continue by my mercy. So the Supreme Lord, Krishna, is talking to Narada Muni. So let me reset the stage, <clears throat> because it's quite fascinating. My apologies to those who were here for the previous classes and heard this, but for some of the newer persons, I'd like to just give them some knowledge as to what these words mean, which I just quoted. It happened to be that Narada Muni, he was just a little boy, he was about five years old, and he was living with his mother at this Brahmin school, and his mother was like a maidservant there, <clears throat> and he was assisting and helping her. And there were some great bhaktas, or bhakti vedantas they're called. A vedantas is one who has higher knowledge, and bhakti means one who has higher knowledge of devotional love. So one who has the knowledge, by higher knowledge, I mean knowledge of the soul, knowledge of God, knowledge of our relationship with God, and knowledge of how to achieve uh, an increase or an intensity of that relationship with the Lord. We all have a relationship, but we have forgotten it. So Bhakti Vedantas, they help us to remember that relation. And they also help us to perform those activ activities 
which will bring us to uh, a consciousness which will make us more and more aware of that relationship with Krishna. That consciousness is called a pure consciousness or transcendental consciousness or Krishna consciousness. It's basically the same. But their only business is to honor Krishna, to glorify Krishna, to teach about Krishna, to surrender themselves more and more to Krishna. When they say, well, if they already fully God realized, how much more can they surrender? In their mind, there's no end. They always feel that they haven't surrendered enough. Surrender meaning, I give you my eyes, Krishna. I give you my brain, my mind. I give you my intelligence. I give you my imagination. I give you my creativity. I give you my hands. I give you my feet. I give you my legs. I give you my heart. I give you my uh, uh, intelligence. I give you my soul. Actually, the soul already belongs to you, but I recognize that it is yours, that it comes from you, and that in giving it to you, uh, or recognizing that it is yours, I pray that you will enable me to always want to serve you, to love you, to honor you, and to bow down to you, and to never forget you. This is the prayer of the Bhagavad So, uh, if he forgets Krishna for even one second during the day, that to him is a grave fault. So that's why some of these very great saints, uh, they put themselves down, they consider themselves not very advanced. Because one second or five seconds, they didn't remember Krishna, they forgot. Their goal their desire is simply to always, ongoing, no matter what they're doing, just as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, whatever austerities you perform, do it for me. In this way, you'll be free from the bondage of work and its auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to So Krishna is making a firm promise <clears throat> that if you give up, give up your words to Krishna, give up your thoughts to Krishna, give up your feelings to Krishna, give up your everything to Krishna. Consider your body no longer yours. Consider your body Krishna's. It belongs really to your spiritual master, whom you offered it to, in the hope and in the faith that by his grace, he will give to you a greater and greater desire to want to know Krishna, to serve Krishna, to love Krishna, to honor Krishna, and to consider Krishna your all in all. As it mentions in the song we sing every morning, the spirit, by the mercy of the spiritual master, one receives the benediction of Krishna. Without the grace of the spiritual master, one cannot make any advancement. Therefore, I should always remember and praise the spiritual master. At least three times a day, let me offer my respectful obeisances under the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. So that's a very, very important. Uh, we cannot make any advancement except through the mercy of the spiritual master. Why is that? Because the spiritual master is such a confidential servitor of the Lord that when the spiritual master prays to the Lord for you or for me or for any and all of us, Krishna listens up. Because that particular devotee is so dear to him, so near to him, so close to him, so loved by him, that he will do anything and everything that that devotee asks of him. And what does he ask? Please, O oh Lord, give your blessings to my devotee, who is full of faults, full of failings, full of difficulties, full of tribulations. But he is trying so hard. He is sincere. 
He's dedicated. He wants to serve your mission. So would you please give him your mercy? So when the Lord hears this, of course, the Lord gives that mercy. If we simply ask for it, the Lord will listen. But he hesitates to give it because we have not gone through the disciplic succession. It's like jumping to the Lord without going to the one who has introduced you to the Lord. It's very much like, for example, you have a president or a governor and you want to speak to the governor. So you just can't walk into the governor's mansion and then walk through one door and another door and then finally you get to the governor's door and then you start banging. Hey, governor! Hey, governor, I want to talk to you. <clears throat> you won't get very far. You won't even get to the door. <laughs> no way. As soon as you even come to the first door, somebody will say to you, what, what would you like? He says, well, I want to talk to the governor. And she say, well, does the governor know you? He says, no, but it really doesn't matter. He's my governor. I voted for him. Well, that's all well and good, but uh, uh, what, what do you want to talk to him about? Well, I'll tell to him. No, no, you have to tell me first. And what do I have to tell you? He's my governor. I voted for him. I didn't vote for you. <laughs> so he says, no, but we have a, 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 a succession or an echelon system that the governor is very busy with very many matters. And so you tell me what the problem is, and I will tell him. <clears throat> and if he has time to deal with this problem, then he will invite you into the office and he will help solve your problem. Or if he has already taught me how to solve your problem, then by, uh, by uh, association or by uh, connection with the governor, you will get the same answer that the governor will give you. So what is your problem? Well, if that's the way I've got to go for it, here's my problem. And he tells him the problem. And he says, you don't have to see the governor because the governor has already taught me what to tell you. So that person says, are you sure? Uh, absolutely, you can write him a letter if you like. And you can write my answer to him. And I'm absolutely 100% that he will confirm the answer. Okay, let's hear it. So he gives me the The point is that we cannot be very uh, disrespectful. We cannot be so. Uh, we cannot be uh, so forthright. We cannot be so demanding. We cannot be uh, so proud as to believe that we're so important that we can just walk into the government's office. This is not the way to obtain things in a civilized way in this so-called civilized world. Uh, I say so-called because there is the veneer of, of civilization here, but underneath the veneer is quite a bit of chaos. And uh, so uh, the same thing with the Lord. It's very good to uh, approach the spiritual master in a mood of devotion, in a mood of submission, in the mood of feeling unassuming and unworthiness to even talk to the Lord. I'm so fallen, I'm so filthy, I'm so full of failings that who am I to approach and talk to Krishna? True, yes, I'd like to talk to Krishna, but after all, I have offended him so many times. I have defied him. I have decried him. I have denied him. It's getting to sound like a poetry lesson here. Uh, I have denied him. Uh, so, uh, why would he want to even look at me, considering the way I have treated him in the past? True, I have glorified him, I have honored him, I have celebrated him uh, later on, and I'm sure that will count something. Nonetheless, uh, I have hurt him. I have disturbed him. I have offended him. How can I be so uh, bold as to feel that I can just walk in and say, Hey, Krish, you know, got something to tell you. 
Well, they're not on that level. Arjuna could do that. He was palsy wowsy with Krishna. Because Krishna invited him to be that way. They were chums. They wrestled together, they played together, they shot arrows together, they they chastised each other in friendship, they called each other fools in friendship. They, you know, that's what friends do. They they often uh, they, they often will will, will say sarcastic things, all in jest and in friendship. Uh, there was a conversation between Advaita Acharya, some of you may remember, and uh, Nityananda. So they were chewing each other out, but it was all friend in friendship and in love. So we're not on that level, and we cannot assume the position that, yes, we can come in and just say, hey, Krish, I've got a little, little, little problem for you. you know, we're not, no. We need to learn awe, reverence, and respect first. And that goes for devotees as well. Temple presidents should be uh, offered certain respect. Even though temple president or sannyasis or TBCs or gurus may invite a certain amount of friendliness, nonetheless, as we know, sometimes, uh, uh, what do they call it? Familiarity breeds uh, indifference and contempt, which is not good. Indifference and contempt is a form of offensiveness, which Krishna does not. So we need to learn this, and we can never stop learning it. And when Krishna sees that you are so respectful, so full of a, a, a desire to honor him, so hesitant, uh, he then invites you. Very interesting story. Once ooh, uh, the charioteer of Krishna, uh, what was his name? Uh, huh? Daruka, yes, thank you. Daruka was, uh, he was standing on the chariot of Krishna, and Krishna was sitting on it, it was a rather warm day, and he was fanning the Lord. And his mood and his thought process was, in his mind he was thinking, how fortunate I am to be able to be fanning the supreme Lord of the universe, I small, tiny, living entity, insignificant, worthless, good for nothing, he is allowing me to stand on his chariot and to fan him, to cool him, and to develop love for him through the process of devotional service of fanning. Wow! This is, this is going on inside him. He's not putting on a show for Krishna. And because it's going on inside, Krishna, of course, is hearing his his mind, his thoughts, and he's feeling the flow of Dawuka's devotion. And he's so pleased by that devotion that he cannot but help want to, uh, because he feels indebtedness, he feels an obligation, he cannot but help want to reciprocate with Dawuka. So he floods his heart with soul is floods the soul with an influx of bhakti, of love. And Garuka begins to feel ever-increasing blissfulness. So as he's fanning the Lord, it's getting more difficult to fan the Lord because his hand is beginning to tremble and it's becoming immobilized. It's like a stun, you know, if anything ever really stunned you, you can't move. You're like... Gaga, you know? And he's getting stunned. His hand hardly could move, and he could hardly speak. He's going to get choked. It's my Lord. Stop. Stop. And Krishna is smiling and saying, Stop what? Because he's pretending he's not doing anything. He's just sitting there getting the fanning. He says, You know what to stop. This is an of devotion, by the way. You know what to stop. I just want to serve you, I can't serve you, but my hand won't move. So you can see what was most important to this pure devotee, why he got the position of being a personal servant of Krishna. Because he had the right understanding, the right attitude. His heart was filled with such a feeling of gratitude such a feeling of appreciation, 
such a feeling that he was truly in a position which doesn't get better. And he felt so unworthy of this position. And Krishna recognized it. And in recognized it, he, he awarded him with this transcendental bliss. But here again, true to his colors of pure devotion, he didn't even want the bliss. What did he want? What did he want? No, he had to love. Service. Service. See, yes, he wanted that service. That was more important. To, and what does it mean? He means it was warm and he wanted to make sure that Krishna was cool. And Krishna didn't feel the heat. He wanted, that's what love is all about. It's about relieving suffering or relieving distress. And it's about giving pleasure. Both are there. So a devotee uh, very much wants to give the Lord pleasure and relieve the distress. One of the ways we relieve the distress of the Lord, because so many of all his children all over the world are so focused and fixed and enamored by Maya, the illusory energy. And they're thinking there's nothing better, greater, higher, bigger than yeah, to be in this world and become big, great, wonderful, to be admired, to be adored, to be bowed down to, and forgetting Krishna completely, who's giving them their very life, their breath, their eyesight, their ability to speak, their ability to think, but forget it. They're thinking it's happening by their own mercy. So Krishna wants them back. It's like a mother or a father when the prodigal son leads home and just becomes, you know, profligate. It just goes and wants to enjoy sense pleasure. The way a person feels lordship, which is what a prodigal son or daughter is, is he wants to enjoy to the senses. He wants to gain material knowledge. And he wants everyone to love him, be his friend. That's enjoyment, that's knowledge, and proprietorship. He wants to own things, and he wants uh, everyone to love him. He wants to not just be liked, but well liked. Any of you ever see that play that we went to in school? It's called Death of a Salesman. Huh? Have you ever saw that? Yes. Oh, you did, okay. But remember, Willie Loman didn't want to just be liked, he wanted to be well liked. And that's the I want to be the Lord of all I pursue. And because he, when he got old, 65 or so, and he was kicked out of his job as a salesman because he couldn't produce anymore. In this country, if you don't produce, you're just a piece of junk. So he wanted to perpetuate his little legacy by forcing his son Viv. To take up, to take up the uh, the cause of willing to become a big time salesman and also be not just liked but well liked. So, uh, but Biff, he he, could, he was like a devotee in one sense. He, he saw through the idiocy of it all, and he told him at the end, "You're nothing but just a plain drummer." He called him. That's what salesmen were called in those days. You're just a drummer who's thrown in the ash can, and you don't want to realize it. And he called his father, he said, Willie, realize it. You're nothing. I'm nothing. Just leave me alone and let me go. I love you, but I don't love what you want me to do. So uh, the important point, some of, the, some of these hmm, plays written by Karmish, Krishna that managed to get his message in here somewhere or another. This play, by the way, is just won every award that you can ever imagine uh, in creation. And not only that, but even <laughs> the playwright Arthur Miller was invited to China, all places, to have that play put on there that was said in Chinese language. Uh, because it was basically, of course, the Chinese use it for their own purposes. Their position was that materialism, you know, the way or democracy to materialism, it, it just leads to misery. Nobody really cares for one another, nobody loves one another, but everybody should be a communist. That's the, that's, that's the message they gave it. But Arthur Miller didn't care. So, um, 
Krishna Prabhupada says yes, we should be spiritual communists, not material communists. That's that's a good thing. That means sharing everything with everybody, sharing Krishna. So getting back to the story here. So Narada Muni, uh, his mother, uh, one night she was going to uh, get some. Uh, when she going? Yeah, she was milking a cow up, I believe. She went to milk a cow. And in the course of doing it, there was a cobra and it bit her. And in a few minutes, she died with the cobra bite. So Narada Muni was only five. He was now a, he was an orphan. Now, previous to that, his mother used to prepare, prepare meals for some bhakti vedantas. That's how I got into all that. They were devotees. And it was the rainy season. And they had taken shelter of the Brahmins' uh, abode. And they went there, and generally is ed- the proper etiquette and when sannyasis, they come, um, they take shelter during the rainy season because they don't travel. It's pretty wet. And the, and the roads are not easy to uh, traverse because of puddles. And, and, and the lakes become over, overflown. Uh, so flow. So anyway, what happened was that uh, Nanda Muni asked, he asked his mother, could I serve those uh, Bhakti Vedanta? She said, yeah, sure, you can bring, bring the food to them and you can listen to them and you'll learn some very wonderful things from these Bhakti Vedanta. So he brought the food to them and they would just sit there and they would have wonderful discussions about Krishna. Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Krishna is to be served. Krishna is to be loved. Krishna is to be honored. The whole wonderful, glorious philosophy of Krishna consciousness. The pastimes of Krishna. How Krishna would do certain things. You know, he could hold up over on hill. Remember that Krishna doesn't do this once. He does it once every day of Brahma in this particular universe. But he's also doing it in other universes. All his pastimes are going on in other universes. There are literally billions of universes. Even the material scientists found out in the Milky Way, I think they found 10 million universes. Uh, recently, I read about it. With not, not the bottom of them, but the material scientists. They found in the Milky Way 10 million universes. A universe is generally made up of a sun and different planets which revolve around the sun. So, uh, billions of universes, and in each universe, uh, once in the day of Brahma, because there's a Brahma in every universe, Krishna plays out his pastimes. So, right now, Krishna is having one pastime, maybe the Putana witch pastime. In another universe, maybe the Trinarvita pastime. In another universe, uh, maybe the uh, Adasura Anyway, uh, the important thing is that the Bhakti Vedantas were talking about the different pastimes of Krishna. And in so doing, they became divided and ecstatic because there's such satisfaction in thinking about Krishna, talking about Krishna, this delight. Because Krishna, who's in the heart, is relishing. You're relishing all of those pastimes. He's appreciating it. And he's feeling some obligation to you. And he's flooding, just as he flooded uh, Dauruka's heart with that, with that love that I talked about, that joyfulness, that blissfulness. Just as he flooded <coughs> Dauruka's heart, he's flooded the Bhakti Vedanta's hearts. And the little Narada, he's seeing, wow, look how joyful they look. Their eyes are open wide, they're glowing, and they're trembling. It's hard for them to even speak. So enwrapped, so rhapsodic are they becoming in their talks about Krishna. So Narada Muni, he's absorbing, he's eating it up, he's digesting it because he has the right attitude. And having the right attitude, uh, he internalized it. And having internalized it, he could remember it. Just as little Prahlad, when he was in the womb of his mother, when Narad Muni spoke these teachings to his mother, Queen Kayadu, 
Narada, who was in there, he was hearing the teachings and he remembered them all. He was in rapture, he was completely focused upon them, and he never forgot them. And when he was five years old, although his father hated Lord Vishnu, he considered his father a fool. And not only that, but he stood up to his father. Can you imagine a little five-year-old boy says, What are you doing? You're hating the only person who could ever do you any good. Meanwhile, the father is thinking he's the Lord of all he surveys. And he then proceeds systematically and unceasingly to kill his little son, who he can't kill because Krishna keeps protecting. The end is this. Who is protecting you like this? Little Pallad says, the same person is protecting you from being killed this very moment. Oh, the same person? What person is that? It's the Supreme Lord Vishnu. Oh, and where is this Vishnu? He's everywhere. Oh, in this pillar? Yes, he's in the pillar. Oh, let me see you, Vishnu. Go ahead, bring him out. I'll bring him out. He takes his fist, boom, boom, boom. And the, the column that he punched it starts to crack. And it starts to shake. And then suddenly there's the sound of of a roaring, heavy, <laughs> like a lion. <laughs> the bed. <laughs> Had to go to the zoo a lot of times to get that down. <laughs> so that's my specialty. Even imitations. Anyway, uh, 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 hopefully it's transcendental, not just my own work. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the Lord, he came out of the pillar, came out of the pillar, and uh, and immediately he jumped in front of Hiranyakashipu, and a fight began. And Hiranyakashipu pulled out his sword, of course, Lord Nusingadev, huge, big, tremendous, and, and he was so angry because this Aranya Kashibu had tried to kill his devotees so many times, and he was about to personally try to kill him. He had thrown him off mountains, thrown him under elephant hoofs. He had uh, thrown him in the water, tried to drown him, tried to starve him, gave him, uh, put him in the heat, tried to burn him, tried to freeze him, poison him. He tried everything, but nothing worked because. If Krishna wants to protect you, no one can what? Kill you. And if Krishna wants to kill you, no one can what? Protect you. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> he didn't get anywhere. So now he felt, well, I'm the most powerful person in the universe. I've got all the powers. I'll kill my son personally. So when he tried to do that, Lord Mishinity got into the act. And he fought and fought and fought and fought. Finally, he was playing with him. But Hiranyi Kashipu was thinking, I'm winning. I'm winning. I'm going to take a little rest now and I'm going to come back and finish him off. So he took five or ten minutes rest. Then he came back. And then Lord Nusingadev said, enough. And the demigods who were watching said, finish him. It's getting dark. It's twilight. These demons, they get more powerful as the night goes on. Get rid of them immediately. So, not wanting to disturb the demigods, he immediately took Hiranyakashipu and uh, took Hiranyakashipu. He put him on his lap in a doorway. It was neither day or night. It was twilight. And uh, so what he did, he took him, and what he did, he took his, his, his nails. We sing that song. Although the sing day, your hands are very beautiful. And with your long nails, you have ripped apart the wasp, Hiranya Kashipu. Unto you, O Lord of the universe, we offer our humble obeisances. O Lord of the you are always giving bliss to your devotee like Pralad Maharaj, and chiseling at the hearts of the demons like Hiranya Kashipu. You are within and you are without. Therefore, we offer our humble obeisances unto you. We sing this every morning. How many of you know the translation on that? Namaste, Narasimha, Naya, Pralada, Lada, Dayane. How many know the translation? Just as I repeated it. Nobody knows the translation? 
Okay, you know who. Word for word. Not word, huh? word for word by word. Okay, we should all know the translation in terms of its meaning. Because uh, it, it's a message for all of us that Lord in the city day, uh, he's so loving of his devotees. And it fills us with such gratitude for Lord in the city day. I mean, here he is, he looks so furious at those long nails, but those nails are beautiful because they rip apart the demons that deprecate us. So <clears throat> it's good to know these translations and uh, to say them in your prayers daily. In fact, all the songs that we sing, if you know them in English as well, it's useful. You may know some of the words, but when you know it in a sentence, it has a specific meaning, it has a specific feeling. And it has a specific nuance. A nuance is a shade of meaning. It has a certain emphasis. And when we say it that way, it's, it starts to make our own hearts bubble up. Because we get the full meaning of it. And it's just for, at least that's my personal experience. Uh, anyone wants to do what they want, that's fine. Uh, anyway, I carry this. Uh, one of my wonderful God brothers. Uh, here is Lord of the Day. It's on my keychain. And I don't think I'm powerful enough to defend myself against so many people, devotees, demons, what have you. Vishal gave this to me as a gift. How many of you know Vishal? Portly Vishal? Okay. And very, very jolly Vishal? He loves Prasadam? Yeah. <laughs> Vishal. Let's call him Prasadam Vishal. Vishal. You know Vishal. I was talking just now, I was just thinking about him, and you say his name. What is that? I was just taking her by the just now. Okay. And you say <laughs> Yeah. So getting back, you know, to this wonderful story, Vishal, one wonderful devotee, goes out every day. Uh, he's in Miami. He distributes at least 5, 10, 15 of Prabhupada's books every day. It's standard. And even though he has to kind of uh, waddle a little bit like a duck, you know, because he's so huge. Uh, so he waddles out there, you know, and but he's has such a friendly personality. He says, Excuse me, ma'am, I've got a really beautiful gift for you, and I want you to have this. And he gives them the gift, and they look at the beautiful picture of this one. And could you just throw in a buck or two for good luck so that you know, I can get more of these books printed? Because you're going to just love it. He's so outgoing and so full of uh, uh, bhakti, so full of devotion, love, and uh, it's wonderful. We should never judge a devotee. Just on, it's mentioned in the nectar of instruction to judge a devotee on how he or she looks. Uh, if he has rashes on his face, if he happens to be uh, twice the weight that he should be, uh, we should not think in those terms. Krishna doesn't even look at that. He only looks at what's in that person's heart. So he gave me this. And the other side of it is a picture of our beautiful Srila Prabhupada. So I consider this the greatest, one of the greatest gifts I've gotten because it helps me to remember. Just like your shirt, you know, the shirt, it remembers, helps me to remember, you know, Lord Jagannath, helps me to remember uh, Lord Nusikade. Uh, all of these are very, very important.